everyone. Thank you very much, Unlimited, for inviting me down here today. Uh, it's the last presentation, and I think there's a performance, so hold on, we're almost there. Hello, I'm Joel. I made a company with my friend Pete called Helicar and Lewis. My surname's Lewis, his surname's Helicar. We save our imagination for our work rather than the name of our company. So Helicar and Lewis is the least imaginative thing about us. Um, he doesn't wear glasses. It's a lie, that photograph. So if you see Mr. Helicar wearing a pair of glasses, it's complete rubbish. So what do we do at Helicar and Lewis? We make experiences in the real world. So we like to use technology to give people magical experiences that take them into the moment. We love websites. We think the web is awesome. But the thing we always say about the web is we've never cried in front of a website. It's kind of a provocation, but we think the real world really is the killer app. You know, the internet's a great place for sharing memories, but you make memories in the real world. I'm not going to talk so much about Helicar and Lewis today. I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. Um, but just to give you guys a little idea of what we do at Helicar and Lewis, this is a project that... Can you even, can you even see that? It's, this is a project that we did back in New Zealand uh, three and a half years ago now. Uh, it was for a company called New Zealand Telecom. We set up a whole bunch of interactive spaces in the street in Auckland. Uh, and it was to launch the rebrand of New Zealand Telecom. They really wanted to stick up their logo everywhere, and we said that was a really bad idea. So we worked with them to make an hour-long performance that was activated by people's bodies and their movement, rather than having to turn on and you know, download an iPhone app or turn on your Bluetooth or SMS someone or something. None of those things ever work. Uh, so we use people's bodies to make this. So you can see what's going on here. We're capturing people's body silhouettes in real time and then projecting that up on the building. I'm sure you guys have seen all this kind of latest buzzword in marketing is projection mapping. We did that four years ago, interactively, in real time, instead of just video playback, which is what most of the projects you see today are. So people can make gestures. Uh, they put their hands out like that and then they could grow a tree out of their head. Kids loved it too. Uh, grannies as well, you'll see some grannies interacting with it. I wouldn't recommend backflipping in front of any of these interactive installations. It's a very bad idea. Um, but that's just a little idea of the kind of things that we do in the real world. But how did I get here? Well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background today. But I think the main thing that I want everyone to get out of this is that I've never known what I wanted to do. Uh, my sister always knew that she wanted to be a doctor from like eight. Uh, and I was always jealous of her because she always knew she wanted to be a doctor and now she is. She's a GP up in Leeds and it's fantastic and amazing. But I've never known what I wanted to do and I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I've, I've got no idea. So, but I think the thing that I learned in my life so far is that knowing what you don't want to do is just as important, if not more valuable, than knowing what you do want to do and basing the things that you don't want to do on experience rather than just like a gut feeling or I, I probably don't think I won't like that. So I'm just going to tell you the, some of the weird jobs that I've done along the way. So I started working at age 14. Uh, I had my dream job at age 14. It was amazing. Uh, I was working for Bullfrog Computers, uh, computer games. Oh my God, I got paid to play computer games all day. It was amazing. Uh, I did it for two weeks. Uh, it was just work experience. I, I didn't really, you know, but I, I felt like it was my first experience of the real world. So I made Dungeon Keeper and Theme Hospital. I made. I, I did some bug reports for it, but that's what I worked on earlier on. Then I worked for Big Blue uh, when I was 17. Uh, when I was eight years old, I got moved up a year because I was being disruptive in class because I'd finish all my work before everyone else and then start disrupting everyone else and messing with them. So I went and worked for IBM for a year because I was smart enough at 17 to know that I should be of a legal drinking age to go to university. So I thought I'd cash in that year and work for IBM for a year. It was totally weird. Uh, I had a secretary. I didn't know what to do with her. I had, I had, I had... It was really weird. I had, a, I, had a, I had an office. I had a corner office with a glass window. And at IBM, there were like people who had been there for 50 years. And, you know, me walks in at 17. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And they're all like, oh, I hate you. So uh, it was a bit weird. I went to lots of meetings about meetings. But what IBM taught me, it was lots of meetings about meetings. They also taught me how to do presentations. They put me through their presentation training course. If anyone else wants to do it, I've got all the notes from it. I'll send you it. Uh, it's a really good course. I recommend it. Um, but at the end of my time at IBM, I realized that the thing that IBM taught me was that I never, ever, 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 ever wanted to go about a meeting, about a meeting, ever again. Yeah, there you go. 
and I didn't want to work for a big company because it didn't feel natural. It felt really weird. It felt like a strange cult, uh, which is kind of what big businesses are. Ooh, controversial. Uh, then I went to Imperial. Uh, I, I did maths and computer science at Imperial. Um, I would been kind of groomed from a young age to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, I feel a bit weird standing up here now because I've had every advantage anyone could ever possibly have. I'm white. I'm male. I've come from a stable middle class background with both mother and father all the way through. So I feel like a bit of a fraud standing up here, but I still managed to mess things up along the way. So that just goes to show it, doesn't, it makes no difference what your background was. It only makes a difference of what you do with your life. That's what makes the difference. So I went to Imperial. Uh, I've been groomed to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, all my dad's side of the family went to Trinity uh, Cambridge. All my uh, mum's side went to Trinity Oxford. I went for my interview at Oxford and they asked me at the last bit, would you like to come here? And I said, no. <laughs> Top tip, if you want to get to Oxbridge, don't say no at the interview. They don't like it. Uh, and then I went to Imperial and the guy taking me around the Imperial Open Day had a Star Wars t-shirt on. And I was like, these are my people. This is where I need to be. So I did three years at Imperial. It was fantastic. Uh, but while I was there at Imperial, I really got into student media. I started working at the student newspaper there called Felix that was set up by H.G. Wells, bizarrely, a couple of, about 150 years ago. I don't know if anyone knows about Imperial University. It's a science and technology university. It's kind of like the MIT of the UK. If you do biology at Imperial, you're kind of seen as an art student. You know, it's a bit squidgy, not hard science like physics or engineering. And as a result, there was no one who was interested in student media, so I had an entire newspaper to play with. After a year at uh, Imperial, I started working for Days to Confuse magazine. I sent off applications to all the cool student newspaper magazines and things like that all over London. Uh, and they said, uh, what was it? The Face wrote back and said, two minutes, thank you, uh, how dare you apply? The Face magazine was like, you're doing a degree in maths and computer science. How dare you apply? We don't need to worry about maths and computers in the next five years. Well, they've gone bust now, so fuck the face. Uh, and, and Dazed, who are amazing, uh, if a little messed up, but all the best magazines are, said, yeah, come down. And I started doing work experience there and spent five years there. It was fantastic. Um, while I was there, I really got into art and, edu uh, and film particularly, and uh, I just followed my dream. I, uh, Blade Runner is my favorite movie of all time. I looked up where Ridley Scott went to university. He went to the Royal College of Art, so I was like, maybe I'll be good as Ridley if I went to the Royal College of Art. Um, so I, that's where I went. I went to RCA. It was fantastic. This is a project I did in my first year at Royal College of Art. It's quite conceptual. It's a pair of glasses that only let you look at cool things. So the tortoise is cool, so I can see the tortoise. Darius is not cool, so I cannot see Darius. Um, that was kind of an investigation into what things would happen if technology had a personality. Um, after I left Imperial, uh, just before I left uh, Royal College of Art, just before I graduated, uh, I was walking down Victoria Park Road, and I was one of the first people in the, the country to get mugged for their iPod. Uh, I, was, I, had the, I was mugged in 2003 for my iPod. I was left for dead on Victoria Park Road. I was viciously attacked from behind and left for dead on the road. It was a horrible experience, especially trying to explain to the police officers what an iPod was. Because uh, it was kind of like, what, it's like a mini disc player? It's like, yeah, kind of. And also the frustration of knowing that the person who'd mugged me didn't have a firewire cable, so they wouldn't even be able to use it properly. Uh, that was the most frustrating thing. But I forgave. I accepted, but I needed some time away from London, so I went to Italy and I spent a year working for Benetton and their creative institute there, Fabrica. And while I was there, I heard about a company called United Visual Artists. I obsessed about them, I emailed them, I faxed them, I blogged them, I bothered them. Uh, and on the day I left uh, Fabrica, I turned up at UVA with my bag from the flight and said, you're giving me a job. Uh, they, I think they were a bit scared, but two weeks later, I worked on my first tour, which was uh, with uh, U2. So the first show I ever worked on was U2, and I've slowly been working my way down ever since. Uh, I did two years on the road with Massive Attack. This was the show that I worked on for them. Uh, I roadied. I went on the year, a year on the road with Massive Attack for a year and a half. It was quite amazing. All the roadies used to take the piss out of me because I was actually into the band that I was on the road with. Uh, they were into bands like Yes and uh, Love, which are great bands, but not as good as Massive Attack. Uh, this is me on the road in Tokyo with my fans. Um, this is me with the legend Horace Andy in San Francisco. Uh, ask me for some interesting stories about Horace Andy later on in the bar, not really for public consumption. I guess the thing that I want to leave you with uh, is this thought of what is the thing that you do 
when you're meant to be doing something else. Because all through my life I got told off for playing computer games or listening to music or looking at photographs or watching movies or reading comics. And if you're into those things, your peers will be into them as well and you can make a business about them. So I'd just like you to think about that. Thank you very much.